scenarios may be imagined, each mixed with truths and falsehoods, how populations and communities and governments and corporations and international institutions respond when the kettle starts boiling are also unpredictable factors. It is one thing to say to a country you should be educating your consumers about how they should use biodegradable materials instead of non-biodegradable plastics. They don't. India, Indonesia are two good examples. And they're the leading polluters. China should say that if we're gaining a population of professional class of more than 350 million individuals, more than the entire population of America, people with advanced degrees, people with acute learning and skills, and they're raising their standard of living, maybe to help the planet, they should also be concerned about not increasing their meat consumption by 300% per year, but that's exactly what they've done. Therefore, no matter what they're achieving with their technology, they're undermining it with their lack of political, cultural, and individual choices. It seems as if no one is willing to be conscious of the consequences of eternal growth in any country, least of all the three most polluting countries, India, China, and the United States. And so it shouldn't be surprising when all the garbage ends up in the ocean because we overpackage it, overprocess it, overplasticize it, and then demand that it be done. But we don't educate the public about the things they're using or the consequences or how it should be used or disposed of. We've become an obsolescent society. Use it and throw it away. In turn, what we have is we should be turning toward more progressive solutions and work in communal harmony together, but more likely will be conversely descending into authoritarian and fascist tribalism. However, there is one fact that we can absolutely be certain of. Individuals, communities, towns and cities, governments and nations will experience increasing distress and billions of lives will be at stake, millions lost. Just during the past year, climate scientists have been telling us that global greenhouse emissions have reached 36.8 billion tons, beating last year's record. The United States, China, and India continue to be the world's largest emitters of emissions. In the United States, the armed forces is the number one emitter, yet there's virtually zero accountability. And just yesterday, both Democrats and Republicans voted for over a $700 billion plus budget as if somehow that money is being properly spent. None of that money is being spent on environmental sustainability. It's all being based upon continuing pollution of the water, the air, and the soil with depleted uranium and other forms of, of environmental destructions. Nine climate change tipping points are currently active, threatening a cascade events beyond our capacity to curtail them, and they're doing it now. Atmospheric scientists are now warning that Category 6 superstorms never before experienced, except this past year over the Bahamas, are going to be the new norm. A near-term future drought is expected to hit half of America's wheat fields at once. Scientists are suggesting the growing climate crisis may make California too dangerous to live in. The Arctic permafrost is melting 70 years earlier than previously predicted and has reached a critical threshold. The entire Arctic emits more carbon now than it absorbs. And behind that melting of the ice and melting of the permafrost at the bottom and surrounding the Arctic is all the methane. In fact, just Last week, Russian scientists found a sea of methane, millions upon millions of methane flutes coming up, issuing enormous amount of methane. They didn't know it existed, and there it is. Greenland's ice sheet is melting 700% faster than ordinarily expected or originally calculated. Alaska's sea ice has completely melted away. Floods are predicted to uproot 50 million people annually. 
as the climate heats up. In August, the Gulf Stream was observed to be slowing down, which would mean a more sudden rise in sea levels in a hotter Florida. The rapid destruction of the Amazon may lead to a cascading collapse of the entire region's natural systems. American urban areas have failed to plan for the coming heat waves that will adversely affect those living there. They're most vulnerable. Why? Because all that concrete, all that steel, it holds heat. Almost 2 billion people are at risk of water shortages due to disappearing glaciers and drying rivers. In fact, in Bali, which you could walk across from one end to the other in two days, most of the rivers have dried up. Population migrations of climate refugees is accelerating at a rapid pace. BBC News reports that climate math gives us 18 months to turn, turn things around dramatically instead of the earlier 12-year IPCC report from last year. Let me repeat that. The BBC is basing it upon a group of scientists who say we have 18 months to turn things around. Analysts predict that climate change will trigger the next major global financial collapse. These are just a small sampling of the numerous other headlines to be read in the off-the-beaten-track of independent news reporting. Rarely are there ever headlines in the corporate media like the ones I just shared. One reason is because of censorship. Last July, a journalist investigations published in Energy and Environmental News uncovered that the Federal U.S. Geological Survey, which channels climate reports to the mainstream networks, provides, quote, sanitized spin of events directly associated with climate change, meaning they're covering it up. Therefore, the average person only receives a tiny sliver of the actual findings being released by the scientific community. And more often than not, these events are not reported in the context of climate change. Why? Fear. Fear of what? Of realizing that our federal government, our state government, our local governments, and corporate American individuals have simply turned their backs on making the change in any timely manner. In fact, there is no change, zero change, across all of America. You see, you can't just put a solar panel on everyone's roof and say, job well done, Al Gore. Now we just doubled your 7 to $14 billion hedge fund. No. You could plant a trillion trees. It would not stop what is happening. You have to stop the pollution. And that we absolutely refuse to. Americans are not going to change their diet. They're eating more meat than ever before. We are fatter than ever before. We're sicker than ever before. We want more things, more stuff than ever before. And if we don't have the disposable income to buy it, we'll use credit. The majority of Americans, 97% of climate scientists, regard global warming as a very real problem that is largely caused by human emission of greenhouse gases. In 2016, 70%, according to a Yale University survey, expressed deep concerns that figure has increased to 80% now, believing that human activity is responsible for the rapid changes being experienced, and 50% view it as an urgent crisis. Well, that's good. If 80% of the people recognize that human activity is responsible, then clearly we, if we all get together and work together, we could have 80% of our personal involvement of what we're creating, the crisis, help resolve itself. No. You don't even have 1% making those positive changes. So where we become aware of a problem doesn't mean we become active ourselves. Nevertheless, only 48%, less than half, believe that we can pull through the crisis by making minor sacrifices. Not major, minor. There is no minor sacrifice we can make that's going to change the cataclysmic events that are unfolding. And while 18% believe that nothing needs to change, wow, what world are they living in? They're living in bubbles. The latter group are those who are still doubtful or dismiss global warming altogether. 
That's the benefit of being propagandized or living with cognitive dissonance. You simply don't acknowledge the truth. Consequently, the public still perceives climate change as too impersonal, too distant, and too unlikely to have any immediate impact upon their lives and financial well-being. Most people continue to believe that aside from the weather getting hotter or wetter, their lives will not change substantially. But if we can understand more deeply how climate change will directly disrupt our lives, our health, and our bank account, then it might trigger our determination to make the necessary changes in our lives so that we are not contributors to the problems, but rather their solution. Thus far, the threats have not been adequately translated into the broader impacts being ushered in by these crises. According to a major study released by Yale and George Mason Universities in this year, Climate Change in the American Mind is the title, Americans still fail to realize and understand how these changes are contributing to the decline in the quality of physical and mental health, food shortages, poverty, inequality, and weakness in our national security. For example, climate change and the endless burning of fossil fuels are already having a direct dramatic impact on people's health. Dr. Jonathan Patz, Director of Global Health Institute at the University of Wisconsin, has charted the rise of health problems and diseases associated with longer periods of hotter days that can be directly attributed to anthropogenic greenhouse gas emissions, especially in large urban areas. His institute predicts a startling increase in respiratory and infectious diseases, malnutrition, hunger, and mental disorders. Heat stroke and cardiac arrest have already been ruled as climate-related illnesses. People with allergies and asthma will suffer from worsening ozone haze that accompanies hotter weather, such as Pennsylvania is now witnessing. In drier southern regions, bacterial-borne infections such as malaria and Lyme's disease will escalate. In areas with excess rainfall, we are witnessing a rise in waterborne infections such as E. coli and hepatitis that contribute to a large assortment of chronic gastrointestinal and respiratory illnesses and death. Droughts can also contribute to a rise in waterborne pathogens as water treatment facilities become inundated with contaminated surface water. And with the escalation of extreme weather conditions adversely affecting people's livelihood, such as tropical storms and wildfires, Mental disorders such as depression, anxiety, and post-traumatic stress disorders are going to rise in extreme fashion. Moreover, the Yale George Mason study reports a strong national reluctance to accept the demand for more regulation on emissions and the necessity to increase the cost of energy prices. The report identifies other shortcomings for average Americans to mobilize to the extent being witnessed in other countries, particularly in Europe. For example, only about 10% of Americans have actually reacted out to government officials and, and by writing letters or emails to communicate their fears. And only 1 in 10 Americans confirm that they speak about climate change even with their family and friends and community members. In other words, while climate change is growing in public awareness, the incentive to act and make fundamental personal changes to our lifestyles and behavior lags far behind or is simply non-existent, as it is most people. Unfortunately, a large majority of climate models used to predict futuristic environmental conditions are based upon an end-of-the-century benchmark. Oh, that'll be in 80 years, 2100. Yet long before that time, in fact, within the next two years, we will already be living in a completely different world because these scenarios fail to account for the numerous incremental changes underway. Depending upon the region where you live, the harsh realities of climate change are already being felt differently. American coastlines, especially along the Gulf Coast and the Atlantic seaboard from the Florida Keys to Boston, are experiencing the brunt of sea level rises. All of the major cities dotting along the Atlantic are victims in waiting for extreme storms, ocean surges and increased flooding, and nothing 
And when I say nothing, I mean nothing has been done to, pre done to prevent it. In Miami and surrounding cities, climate impacts have, have already started to adversely shape everyday life. And no major concerted effort is being made to prevent or lessen the impacts of higher category storms and rising tides, such as concerted mobilization of populations further inland. On the other hand, inland New England to eastern New York, along with the northern Midwest regions along the Great Lakes and the northwestern regions of states, are best positioned for the decades ahead. It is not simply a matter of listing cities and regions and states that are sustainable or not. Instead, we must look at communities, preferably smaller and ideally rural or marginally rural, including those that are known as intentional or cooperative communities. These tend to have sufficient clean water, healthy soil, and are moving towards renewable energy sources. These are much, much like the old communities settled by the Quakers in the Pennsylvania Valley or the Shakers along the Hudson River. Individuals are able to maintain their autonomy, yet still share common collective behaviors, such as organic farms and arts and crafts, and offering these to the larger economy. Our modern cities are congested, overcrowded, polluted, thriving on competition, contributing to enormous income inequality and enormous personal stress. We are hyperkinetic when you're in the city. Nobody moves to New York City or Los Angeles for their health. They move there for their careers. Therefore, in states such as California, New York, and Texas, one can still find smaller regions that are not only sustainable but also progressive and have the communal resilience to withstand unexpected climate threats. They are also far less susceptible to the adverse effects of 5G technology being implemented throughout the nation. They will be least affected in rural America. Vermont, for example, is the most politically progressive, environmentally friendly state in the nation. A joint collaboration between the state government Vermont's universities and local farming and renewable energy organizations has brought the state to 90% self-reliance for its energy, food, and housing needs. Compared to the dismal sustainability statistics throughout most of the remaining 49 states, this is a remarkable proactive achievement that other states must adopt quickly despite Vermont being the eighth fastest warming state after Alaska, New Mexico, Arizona, Utah, New Jersey, and Colorado. However, climate change gives no consideration for borders, your body politic, your ideology, your personal preferences or boundaries, nor state legislatures. Excessive rains contributing to extreme floods are predicted to plague even the most resilient regions, including Vermont. During extreme flooding events, crops and orchards are severely damaged across the inland northeastern and heartland grain states, rendering them minimally sustainable. For much of the remaining the United States, aside from local regions, commonly are referred to as the lifeboat zones, conditions will worsen from longer periods of drought, extreme storms and tornadoes and water shortages. Although still s several decades away, the Ogallaga Fossil Water Aquifer, which provides eight states from South Dakota to Texas with the water necessary for extensive agriculture irrigation, it's being depleted. Now, it may be depleted much faster because no one's putting the brakes on. This is the breadbasket of America, supplying upwards of 20% of the nation's crop harvest. This 10 million year old deep reservoir was created during the Pliocene age and would require over 6,000 years to replenish itself naturally. The aquifer has already peaked for Texas, followed by New Mexico, Kansas, Oklahoma, before 2012. In the near future, ac accessible water will decline more rapidly until some states will no longer have that aquifer to use for people or irrigation or industry. Industrial agriculture is water intensive. U.S. farms use approximately 57 million gallons of water per day just for irrigation. This is almost 300% more water than is consumed daily throughout our public 
water supply systems that feed into our homes and businesses, chemical-based agriculture because it contributes to rapid soil degradation and erosion requires far more water than organic farming to produce a similar yield. Organic living soil retains moisture and also uses nitrogen more efficiently. Finally, since organic agriculture has no need for chemical fertilizers, pesticides, and herbicides, it produces only a small carbon footprint. A study conducted by the Rodell Institute measured the amount of energy required to grow a hectare of organic corn versus a hectare of corn using conventional chemical methods. On average, the conventional crop required 71% more energy than the organic. 41% of this energy excess was due to the use of nitrogen-based fertilizers. However, aside from conventional agriculture's contribution to greenhouse gas emissions, it also threatens our nation's food security. For those who seriously consider migrating to a new region, additional economic and civil concern factors into climate preparedness, including financial and residential safety, and emerging and infrastructure preparedness, transportation, and strong local economies that are not at the mercy of imports. In this regard, all of the New England states, along with Minnesota, Hawaii, and Washington, top the list. Those states that are worst placed for experiencing climate catastrophes most quickly, according to personal finance analysts from Wallet Hub, also happen to be the weakest in economic and social security preparedness. Mississippi, Louisiana, Texas, Florida, Arkansas, Alabama, Missouri, and Alaska. There is already growing warnings that humanity may have passed its threshold whereby our governments, international institutions, and science itself can turn back the clock. Therefore, more scientists and environmental experts and activists are demanding that instead of waiting in hope for answers, we begin to learn immediately how to adopt to harsher conditions that are becoming the new normal. Remaining, remaining engaged with others who share your concerns over accelerating climate change and a further breakdown of our urban and rural infrastructures is crucial for sustaining a sense of calm and wellness. Climate-related stress and anxiety and the accompanying physical and mental problems associated with it are already being felt across the nation. Victims of recent extreme storms in the South, victims of massive flooding in the Midwest, victims of California's endless droughts and wildfires, and victims of life-threatening heat waves in the arid basins of the Southwest are just a few immediate examples. In the past, we have always relied upon advanced engineering and technological ingenuity to put us out of a crisis. Yet, at our present moment, and after decades of institutional denial since the first warnings about global warming almost a half a century ago, scientists are gradually telling us that we have passed the point of no return. The train has left the station, and there's no engineer in the driver's seat. We need to begin preparing for the worst, now. And that begins with ourselves and our local communities. And if you don't have a local community, find one. If you have to try to convince people to do the right thing, you're dealing with the wrong people. Our governments have proven to be completely unreliable. The key expression now is to start learning how to adapt to the changes ahead because there will be many. This begins by reevaluating our own lives and identifying how our habits of consumption are contributing to the warming planet. The standard of living we have taken for granted will incrementally disappear. For too long, our civilization has been bankrupting itself and destroying itself in the process. It is the rare individual, though they do exist, who has actually lived as a good and conscientious shepherd on this earth. It is also critical to understand that the rise in nationalistic sentiments in the United States and Europe only worsens our ability to lessen greenhouse emissions and polluting the oceans and destruction of our remaining protected wildernesses. Nationalism is the antithesis of thinking globally. Every nation is based upon economic and job growth, manufacturing and security that have an enormous toll on natural resources. For example, Karl Marx 
perhaps one of the first environmental visionaries, noted that, quote, man lives on nature. Yes. Means that nature is his body with which he must remain in continuous exchange if he is not to die. That man's physical and spiritual life is linked to nature means simply that nature is linked to itself, for man is a part of nature. End quote. Marx was also the first to observe that capitalism was a fundamental reason for humanity's increasing alienation from nature and contributed to the loss of our relationship with the natural world. Henry Thoreau would completely agree. He said, quote, A town is saved not more by the righteous me in it than by the woods and swamps that surround it. With learning to adapt to climate change as our paramount take, over the years several groups have dedicated themselves to preparing citizens for the future rather than relying on the hopes that government and industry will save us. There is the Transition Network. This is an international movement started in the United Kingdom by the creative visionary Rob Hopkins in 2005 to mobilize cities and towns and small communities to collectively harness their skills and talents to proactively address the larger future challenges by starting at the local level with direct civil engagement. There are today thousands of transition towns in over 50 countries, and there are more than 167 active transition initiatives across America. Then there's the Deep Adaptation Network, a network of professionals, including many climatologists, lay people, building collaborations to explore the implications of a near-term societal collapse due to climate change. It was founded by Professor Jim Bendel at, uh, at um, a university in the United Kingdom, and the network maintains that the chances of reversing course are non-existent for people communities and cities, they need to begin preparing to adapt to catastrophic disruption of life starting in the very near future, which means now. That's Cumbrera University, by the way. Then there's the Dark Mountain Project. <clears throat> For those who are creative, artists, and poetic, the Dark Mountain Project is a loose international network of ecologically minded writers and artists dedicated to deconstructing the language and images our capitalist civilization habitually relies upon to tell stories of humanity's place and the role in the world in alienation from in nature and other species. Rather, the project's members are creating new stories to uncivilize our cultural psyche. Then we have something really new, and that's the Extinction Rebellion. I do not personally support their methods. I do appreciate their overarching Ideas. It's a global environmental movement committed to nonviolent civil disobedience to coerce governments and industries to wake up and take responsibility for their actions in fueling global warming trends. And although the Extinction Rebellion has its detractors and critics among environmental organizations, outside the United Kingdom, the movement is decentralized, grassroots, and spontaneous. Its sole objective is to be a loud public voice warning of the dire impact of climate change. Then you have Keepers of the Waters. This is an international and grassroots art, science, and community project started in the U.S. that is devoted to transforming our relationship with water through community efforts to integrate water awareness into city and town planning. A predominant social illness infecting our culture is its failure or refusal to weigh the motivations and the probable results from its actions. Leveling a tropical forest in the Amazon basin may be good for the business of sowing genetically modified soybeans or to graze more beef, cattle, to meet China's insane taste for meat, but what are the long-term effects? At what cost is the payback? This principle also applies to our personal lives. The same can be said for purchasing clothes manufactured in a sweat factory in Bangladesh or Indonesia or India, or stocking up on the latest electronics that rely upon massive mining efforts for rare earth metals and exploiting young kids to do it in Africa, the latest gas guzzling SUV and searching for the best and cheapest discounts at Amazon. 
If we learn to weigh our actions in scale with their likely effects honestly, we can enrich and improve our lives immensely. And we can be comforted knowing that our actions will not adversely affect the lives of others. Natural biosystems do this instinctively. It is inherent throughout the energetic flow and balance and stability with healthy ecological communities. And it is part of the wider ecological awareness that we so desperately need to adopt and cultivate and so urgently to be done. If this were three decades ago, we would have been in a different place. I would have been very confident that today's baby boomers and senior citizens, having participated in cultural transformations and revolutions, would have had a collective mindset to make personal sacrifices and demand the government to do the same. It would be easy to envision a global, uh, a global Marshall Plan for the environment. Today, there's a different perspective and dramatically different standards of living. We can hope that the majority of boomers believe climate change is real. To save the planet, we must reduce our consumption of good and natural resources by 600%. This simply will not happen, ever. The fact is that China, India, and the United States are increasing their exploitations, and that is increasing global warming. So if governments, industries, and the average person will not willingly change, then who will? Hence, we must rely upon ourselves and build relationships with those who are determined to do the same. Two decades into the 21st century, we now need to take a, a difficult and brutally honest look at our civilization and draw the conclusion that it is seriously ill and our body top politic is terminally ill. And the oligarchs, the rich, the powerful, the majority at least, are completely disconnected from the responsibility they share. Instead, they're gluttons for pleasure. They're living in the worst of hedonistic principles, the hedonic era over. Pleasure is the only thing that relieves the loss of inner spiritual values for these people. They will not help, but they will exploit. During the middle of the last century, the great German-American existentialist philosopher Paul Tillich and one of the most influential theologians in modern times attempted to tackle the deeper underlying problems that were increasing and dominating modern culture. Paraphrasing Tillich's work for any serious intellectual inquiry into a dire problem, three fundamental questions need to be asked and addressed. First, what is the problem? What is the disease? As individuals, as a society, or as a global family, why are we not where we ought to be? Tillich's second question is, what is our vision? If we were to be whole, healthy, and vibrant human beings residing in harmony with a robust and flourishing planet, what might it be like? Finally, his third question is, how do we move from the first question to the second? In other words, what is our medicine? These are questions for each person to deliberate to themselves. Each of us will find her or his answers and guidance for the best path to follow. It. Nevertheless, to dive into this undertaking, deep deliberation and acquiring a sufficient amount of knowledge is demanded. Then we step into the path that leads to an awkward ecological awareness, and that is that we weren't prepared. We can't just show up and expect everything to change. We must do our homework. We must become consciously aware, consciously looking for the truth. And if we do this, then we can consciously disembark from the road leading towards future discord, denial, and ultimately ruin. This new path will demand us to make realistic and doable changes, adopt new initiatives and interests in order to loosen and discard our personal constraints. After we individually succeed in this endeavor, we will be able to say we are no longer a part of the problem, rather we are now an active participant in the remedies and healing. That is my commentary. I want you to think if you have any additions or challenges or questions or statements, you can call us now at 888-874-4888. That's 888-874-4888. And 
Also, I just want to let you know that we have a lot of new programs coming up, and I'm going to go over now and offer something that we haven't offered before because we've been out of it. And while you're thinking about calling in, just today we received our cookbook back in stock after eight months of having it out of stock. And this is the final go-round for this book, is Curing the Incurable. Now, this is the largest, uh, most complete cookbook I've ever done, and I've had multiple best-selling cookbooks. Every edition here is an original vegan dish and gluten-free. There's a whole section of the book about doctors curing diseases, giving the exact blueprint of how they did it, all with a vegan plant-based diet, including the great Dr. Dean Ornage, and how he was able to reverse nine out of nine people who are going to have heart transplants, their heart taken out of their body, and a new heart put in. He was able to reverse the damage done. We filmed that. Oncologists reversing cancer without chemotherapy or radiation, Neurologist helping people with neurological disorders without the drugs. Yeah, all these are done naturally. And in many cases, the therapies evolved when the people actually healed themselves. The doctors healed themselves. Dr. John McDougall was one of those. So you get a whole group of doctors in that one chapter. You get a whole chapter on stalking the larder, the natural medicine cabinet, how to turn off inflammation in the body, all the herbs, the juices, which are alkaline, which are acid which help, which hurt, which foods you should avoid, which ones you should include. And then you have everything about cleansing, detoxifying, chlorophyll, what are the best nuts, the best seeds, the best vegetables, the best root vegetables, all that is in here. And then you get to the big part of the book, and that is the recipes. Every recipe is my own recipe, an original gourmet recipe. Gourmet meaning it's not just some food thrown on a plate presentation is paramount. These look like they came right off the cover of Gourmet and, and uh, Epicure magazines. The book has won four awards. The recipes have won four awards, more than any other cookbook that I'm aware of in the United States. And it's a big book. I mean, it's, I don't have one in front of me because I'm still in a, an anti-aging study. But I just want to let you know that this is the book that will help you get on your way back to health. Follow the recipes. And all the recipes were tested by average people who are not chefs. And any recipe that they couldn't duplicate in taste and look, then I excluded it. So everything here is a recipe that people who are not chefs or cooks can do. So you can do all these. These were also the recipes that were given at the last health retreat and the recipes given to the people in the anti-aging uh, 60 days on campus. And with this, you're getting a special $40 bonus. You're getting the multi-award winning documentary. And I mean, it's won a lot of awards during the incurable documentary. You get that as well. And that goes much further in depth on all this. So I'm going to give you a number that you're going to call and you can order your Curing the Incurable cookbook until we're out of inventory, and then it's gone. And you get the video, $40 free. So it's only $49.95. It's worth almost $90. It is worth $90 value. You're only paying $49.95 for something that you're going to have fun with, that you can share these recipes with people, and boy, are these healthy recipes. Especially when you start looking at the chapters of how the herbs manifest in your body and which herbs the best herbs? It's all in here. You can order 877-627-5065. Again, 877-627-5065. 877-627-5065. And you can get your copy. And it'll be sent right out today. We do all of our own shipping from in office now, and we ship stuff out the same day. We've got a guy named Josh who is absolutely terrific. Best guy we've ever had in there. And also, those of you who did not, who were on hold yesterday and didn't have a chance to get through, call now. 888-874-4888. 888-874-4888. We're happy to hear what you have to say, because I got to several people, three people yesterday, didn't get to the last several also, for those of you who were uh, trying to reach Luann yesterday, 
to see if you would qualify for the upcoming March through May. And by the way, if you can't be away 60 days, don't call. You've got to be 60 and over. And though we are taking a subgroup of 50-year-olds, uh, I have not seen the results. She had a person on who was in the study, or it still is, and the results of his work were in and analyzed and given to Luann, and she shared them, and they're just remarkable. I mean, just absolutely remarkable. I'm still working with uh, three of the people who came in late into the study. Luann's number, if you want to give her a call, but if she doesn't call you back, it's because she has to get back to you. But she will. But remember, you got to be away for 60 days. You cannot have a life-ending disease. You have to have a positive attitude and be willing to really, almost like a boot camp, you have to be willing to make changes because my protocols are different than anyone else's in the world. And by the way, just this morning, I posted this. You'll see it on, if you go to my personal website, there is a study being conducted right now as we speak, just today, in Colombia, an anti-aging study. They're charging people $1 million dollars to be there. One million dollars. Whoa. Well, good luck with that, but they'll probably be filled up. Uh, but there's no exercise, there's no diet, there's no vitamins, there's no uh, inner journey, journaling, none of that required in their study. Mine, you got to do all the above. Lots of study. There are some costs but lots of studying, lots of meditation, lots of introspection, lots of reflection, lots of juicing, lots of juicing. And uh, it's the first study of its kind ever done. We got phenomenal results. I won't know all the results until next week when they're given to me. I don't have anything to do with the final analysis, calculations. That's done by outside people. And then we're duplicating to make sure it's duplicatable. And a group of scientists are going to be there on campus. I will be there on campus every day, but I won't be running the study. I can't do that. Someone else will be running the study, a group of medical doctors running the study. There's nothing medical in the study, but they're there to give it credibility because no one's ever done it before. So that's it. If you want to see about if you qualify, remember, you can't come and go. You've got to be there. You must be there for 60 days un un uninterrupted. If you can't be there 60 days, don't call the win. If you can, you believe you want to change your aging process, want to change your whole health, your life, then give her a call. Her number is 903-881-7008. 903-881-7008. I expect to have, and I can only have the same number of people in the, this one that I had in the last one. So we'll be filled up in the next, I guess, the next three or four days. Let's say hello to Howie from Queens. Hi, Howie, you're on the air. How are you, Gary? I loved your presentation. I'm 80 years old. I had asthma for 45 years, and in 1990, I cured myself within three months. I haven't been bothered since. I only eat organic food. Uh, I don't eat any other kind of food. I've, um, I drink, uh, I learned this from you, uh, I drink a certain kind of water, which I saw at your, uh, your when you had your a business on Broadway. Uh, I don't know if I should mention the name. Uh, no, I have don't, to... don't. Well, that's well, good to know. So you're 80 years old. You had asthma for most of your life. You don't have it and haven't had it since because you changed to an organic diet. And that's terrific. Thank you. Dylan from New York, your turn. Gary, how are you? Good. Great. I just want to say thank you so much for that amazing commentary. It was just absolutely spot on. Um, man just doesn't have the um, the, um, the ability or the answers to the, the problems in the world, especially the, the climate change, which is just... Yeah, you're right. Everything you said is absolutely correct. And I just want to thank you for your... Um, having this show because I'm sure, I mean, is my diet perfect? No. Am I doing all the things I need to be doing? No, but I'm sure by now I would have been dead had I not implemented some of the things that, the things that you've um, suggested on a day-to-day -day basis. So just wanted to say thank you so much. Um, we appreciate you and, and we love you. So thank you. Thank you, Dylan. I appreciate it. 
I don't look for perfection. I look for what is doable, feasible, and possible. I realize that a lot of people listen to the show, some for decades. I actually had a woman who's been listening for 45 years. And, uh, and they do what they can based upon the circumstances in their life. And doing something is better than doing nothing. And as you said, think how many times people don't realize that they're a certain age and they don't have the diseases or don't look the same as people they graduated from high school or college who didn't take into account that diet was that important or beverages or exercise, etc., or supplementation. So whatever you can take from the show each day, whatever is reasonable to you, if it's not reasonable, don't use it. Come back tomorrow and see if there's something then that is more reasonable. And all the while, those who are shouting from the sidelines and from the subterranean cesspools of our systems, including on Wikipedia, condemning all that is done in the name of health and happiness and spirituality because they're atheists and angry at themselves and the world, the ones that are yelling out, condemning this, they, they have no examples of ideal health. They have no examples of reversing disease of the heart that is so advanced that you'd have to have a heart transplant. They can't show you examples of reversing terminal cancer. We, on the other hand, in the alternative and alternative health community can. And it's not that difficult. Just how much are you willing to change? The more you change, the greater the results. And by the way, finally, I'm going to be doing something uh, starting just after the people who I'm with now and helping to get through the final stages. Again, I had everybody was supposed to start at the same time, but there were uh, a couple of people who couldn't. And as a result, they came a month later. So I got to stay an extra couple weeks and help them through it and then get their final results. Then I'm going to take a couple months. My new film will be done within the next couple weeks. I'll be coming back to New York to premiere it, and then I'm finishing up another a couple of films. But I'm going to film how to build an intentional community from an artist community, like doing something like Hobbit Houses, where every artist has their own house, and then they have their own you know, private sleeping quarters and, and kitchen. But in the front of that, they have a studio. And how that can then be sent out to the world, their messages. So a whole lot of good. Plus how to build the future. The future is in food and water and making it sustainable. How do, how do you build a place that you can uh, grow every kind of food imaginable in a very fast period of time without having all the challenges? People don't know how to do this. Even in intentional communities, they're not doing it. Even in ecological communities. I, I go to communities and I see how they're farming and I'm thinking, you're not looking at what's happening. You're getting too much rain or it's too hot or it's too cold and you're getting your trees blighted. Now you get insects in here. You're getting Lyme's disease. Yet they want to go back to those old models. My family came from Quakers and my mother from Ireland we tracked her, gener her entire lineage clear back to the 1600s. My father was uh, the Huguenot, a uh, French Protestant, and uh, clear back to the 14th century. And I can tell you, you can't go back to the 14th or 16th century and start doing what they did. You can get ideas, but you have to use what we have now. You have to use the best technologies in order to grow he the healthiest food, but under all conditions. You can't just go out and start planting something. Look at all the farms that have just been wiped out in Nebraska and in Arkansas, flooded for three months straight. Everything gone, including their farm, is gone. They can't afford to keep it. We're seeing one of the greatest exoduses from farming in American history because they're not willing to go to where we need to be now. And you, you could do on two acres what someone else, as far as growing crops, would take 200 acres. So I'm going to show how this is done. I'm just going to do it. I did it before. I did it originally up at the Fertiler Farm back in 1971 through 85. I'll do it again and show what the future should be for those who want to be proactive and get ahead of the curve. And that way, if I do it, it's up on the Internet, and I'll have interns who come and want to learn. Then they can see that the future is not going to be bad for a lot of people. It's just who's willing to look ahead to see that the iceberg is in front of us.
and a lot of people aren't. But those of us who are, will be okay. Thank you all for listening, and have a nice day. Watch out! Here we go again. Yep, 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 whip, whip, whip. Them, them, them.